Thanks so much, everyone. It's great to see you. Hope everyone's had a good day today. I've got to tell you, coming to Brisbane is a real thrill. When I was a kid, coming to Brisbane was like coming on a holiday. We used to come up here, and um, my mum used to love shopping. And we've spent at, at Garden City. I don't know. We used to come up here. I was. Am I showing my age? It doesn't look anything like it does today. But there's this memory I have. For some reason, I was in a taxi with my mum and I. We'd been visiting some friends that mum had here, and there was. Mum was a bit of a nervous passenger in a car, and there was. There's one street that my father wasn't allowed to drive on in Brisbane, and that was Sankey Street. I don't know if you know it, but it's particularly steep. And lo and behold, this, we get in this taxi, and he went down Sankey Street like the man from Snowy River. And, and just at the top, ready to go down, and Mum sort of said in a very controlled voice, Driver, I don't let my husband come down this street. And um, that's, that's just one of those amazing memories that I have of Brisbane as a child. It won't go away, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Tonight we're going to look at some amazing evidence. Evidence for the Bible. Tomorrow night we're going to look at evidence for Jesus. Saturday morning at 11 o'clock we're going to look at evidence uh, for Christianity. And Saturday afternoon we're going to put it all together evidence for faith. So I'm so pleased you're here. Welcome and uh, we're going to have a good time and a growing time together. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention. We've got some Bibles and uh, if you're new and you'd like, we'll be looking at a couple of verses from the Bible tonight. If you'd like to grab a Bible, we've got some burly men that are going to be handing out some Bibles and um, if you'd like to as they come past, just give him a wink, give him a nod, and uh, yeah, we've got some for, for you if you'd, if you'd like one. So um, important verses that we'll be looking up, and um, yeah, it'd be really helpful to, to have a Bible. Let me just punch in this. Okay. I'm trying to advance the PowerPoint and it's not moving for some reason. Uh, thank you. Okay. So tonight we're looking at the evidence for the Bible. One of the most famous writers of the 20th century was a Frenchman called Albert Camus. He lived between 1913 and 1916, uh, 1960. He was an atheist. And Camus struggled with really one major question. And that was, what's the meaning of life? He feared that the ultimate meaning of life was meaninglessness. One of his books, it's a collection of essays, was called The Myth of Sisyphus. The title came from an old Greek myth about a man condemned by the gods to eternal punishment. Sisyphus had to push this enormous boulder up a hill and just as he got towards the top, the boulder would roll back down to the bottom and he'd be compelled, forced to roll that boulder up the hill. And so it was just an eternal life of drudgery, meaningless toil, fruitless toil. And for Albert Camus, Sisyphus was a good metaphor for human existence and the apparent fruitlessness of it. He began his book with this, which is perhaps the most controversial passage of literature written in the 20th century. Notice this. He wrote, There is but one truly serious 
philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Now, that's pretty grim, isn't it? Now, he has a point. Who of us hasn't thought about the meaning of life, whether it's worth it? What is life all about? We're all human beings, homo sapiens, rational elements. One cannibalistic tribe is purported to have said, we're just food that talks. But what does it all mean to be a human being, to be food that talks? Why do human beings have an awareness? Why are we aware of some things and not of others? Taking a bit more of a scientific approach was Alex Rosenberg. I'm sorry, we didn't, I'm not there yet. Let me come back to Alex in a moment. Um, a Norwegian, Carl Uwe Knoskoy, he also wondered about the meaning of life. And Nuskoy, he observed something as crowds walked down the street. He looked at these crowds and he said, in 25 years, a third of them would be dead. In 50 years, two thirds. And in 100, all of them. And what would they leave behind? What had their lives been worth? He has a point, a very significant point. And uh, Alex Rosenberg, coming on to, to him, he wrote a very significant book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality. And he says that really, we're nothing but movements of meaningless subatomic particles. Again, this is depressing stuff. Rosenberg admits it, but he has a solution. He says you can rearrange these particles to be more positive. And how does he suggest that these particles be rearranged? He writes, take two of whatever neuropharmacology prescribes. If you don't feel better, in the morning, or two weeks from now, switch to another one. Three weeks is often how long it takes for serotonin uptake, suppression drugs like Prozac, Wilbrutin, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Luvox to kick in. And if one doesn't work, another one probably will. Sadly, that seems to be the attempted solution for so many Australians. An article in the Sydney Morning Herald has this to say. On the entire planet, only one country, Iceland, has a higher rate of use of antidepressants than us Australians. Since 2000, this rate has more than doubled and nearly one in 10 Australians are taking them. They're even being prescribed to more than a thousand children aged between two and six. It's a sign of a deep crisis. And it's only got worse since COVID. There is a crisis of sorts. And so many of us can't put our finger on exactly what it is. But when you think about Australia, I've been fortunate to see a lot of places but Australia truly is an amazing country. This is a good country to live in, in every way. Australia ranks second, sometimes it's first, in the world for quality of life. And the United Nations, that's where they rank it. So, if we can't find help in drugs, legal drugs, if there's so much bad stuff going on, even in a good country like Australia, where can we go to for help? What's happened to us? Is there help available? And is there a solution? Well, I believe there is, and I think it's in this book 
the Bible. In this book, we can find not only the reason for the mess that this world's in, but more importantly, hope and a way out of it. Think about it. When you buy a product, oftentimes what comes with it is a set of instructions, like a manual. Just today, I opened a package, and in there was some repairs that I needed to do on some luggage. And the first line in the luggage and in the instructions to, to, to do this repair was, read all the instructions first. And yet, that's often the last resort, isn't it? Let's look at the instructions when, we, when all else fails. But we have a being who created us, who made us. And the Bible is like a manual. It's like an instruction guide for human beings. And there's some valuable insights in this book. Yes, and it's, a, it's an ancient book, but there's some amazing information and guidance in there. And some people will be thinking to themselves, are you got to be kidding? That book is so outdated. What's, what's relevant in 2024 today? How can all of those expectations ever be met? Well, just looking at what's been featuring in the news in Australia, the domestic violence and the murders, a commandment that says, thou shalt not murder, I think that's particularly relevant in today and in Australia now. And I think there's many spouses who've not only been the victim of domestic violence, but have also been the victim of a, a spouse that's cheated on them. An old commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery, that certainly has relevance as well. It's not that antiquated. We need those principles today. So the Bible, when it's applied correctly, can give us some very relevant and meaningful guidance and insights into the important issues that all of us face. Some people ask, we've all got a conscience. Why can't an individual be guided by their conscience? Well, that's a good question. Listen to some very clear reasoning on this very topic. Somebody once argued this point. If there is a God, then he gives us not only life, but also consciousness and awareness. If I live my life according to my God-given insights, then I cannot go wrong. Even if I do, I know that I have acted in good faith. Well, this sounds reasonable enough, doesn't it? Fair enough? Well, who said these words? It was Adolf Hitler. How much better would last century and even the world today be if Adolf Hitler had have let the Ten Commandments guide his principles rather than his own conscience, what he determined what was right and wrong? Now, at this point, I can anticipate... A number of good questions about the Bible, about its reliability. How can we trust this book? Is it trustworthy? How can we trust that what was written is even anywhere near what we have near? Let's face it, all those years ago, they didn't have photocopy machines. The earliest copies of the Bible were actually reproduced by hand. That's just a recipe, people argue, for mistakes, for errors to come into the text. How do we know that it's actually accurate? How can we trust it? Well, let's have a look at this chart. Here you can see some authors from antiquity. We've got Plato, Caesar, Aristotle, Tacitus, Herodotus, Thucydides. These two, Herodotus, Herodotus and Thucydides are probably two of the most famous and well-known historians from the ancient world. We also have Livy and, down the bottom, the New Testament, all 
small pieces of ancient literature. Let's look at the, the year in which these were written. Plato, he lived 400 BC. Caesar, we can see the years when they lived. Herodotus, around 400 BC. Thucydides, around 400 BC as well. The New Testament, 100 AD. Now, the earliest copies that we have of their literature, let's look at, say, Herodotus, 900 AD, yet he wrote 400 BC. So the time gap between when he wrote and the earliest copies that we have today is 1,300 years. That's a pretty big gap from when he wrote to the earliest copy that we have today. And how many copies of Herodotus do we have? We have eight of those ancient ones. Thucydides, 400 BC he wrote. Our earliest copy, 900 AD. Again, a 1,300-year gap and again, eight copies. We're fortunate to be into double digits with the number of these early copies. Let's notice how the New Testament stacks up against all of those. So the New Testament, written 100 AD, our earliest copy is from 200 AD. There's just a gap there of 100 years. And how many copies of these early manuscripts do we have? 5,300. The numbers say a lot about reason to believe and reason to trust the text. And when you've got 5,300, there's plenty of opportunity to compare those ancient texts and to see that they're all very, very similar. The, the discrepancies are incredibly minor by comparison. So there's something else I'd love to share at this time as well. The earliest copy of a fragment that we have of the New Testament actually dates to within 25 or 30 years of its authorship. It's a fragment from the Gospel of John. Just this small piece of biblical text. As you can see here, it's called the John Ryland's Papyrus. And uh, it's kept today in Manchester in the, United K in the United Kingdom. Now, are you a little curious about the passage of the Bible that's just within 25 or 30 years of John's hand writing this, inspired hand writing this? What's that piece that's been preserved? Well, grab your Bible. Let's have a look at what's actually been saved and preserved for us over all these centuries. Turn with me to John chapter 18. I can, if you've got one of these Bibles that we handed out, I can give you a page number. It's on page 1015. John chapter 18, page 1015. 1015, John 18... And there's two sections. On one, one side, we have John 18, verses 31 to 33. And on the other side, we have verses 37 to 38. Let's have a look. So this is John 18, verses 31 to 33. And it says, Then Pilate said to him, Do you remember Pontius Pilate? So it's a, from the... Closing scenes of Jesus' life on earth. Then Pilate said to him, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? A critical question in the New Testament. Are you the king of the Jews? So that's on one side of that papyrus. And on the other side is verses 37 to 38. 
Another quote from Pilate. Then Pilate said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Anyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And isn't that the critical question in life? The earliest passage of the New Testament that we have, it's as though it's asking our planet today, what is truth? And this is what we're here to discover. Is the Bible reliable? Is it the source of truth? And that's what we want to explore tonight. Now, people say, well, that's the New Testament. We can see that there's an enormous amount of historical evidence to support the validity, the accuracy of the New Testament. There's no other piece of ancient literature that stacks up like the New Testament does. But people say, what about the Old Testament? Can we trust the Old Testament? And for years, people attacked the Old Testament's reliability because the oldest manuscripts available were copies from the 11th century AD. And that was considered to be quite old. How many copies of copies of copies in some monastery were made? How can we know that the Old Testament was reliable? And many so-called experts dished the reliability of the Old Testament. But then, in 1946, something extraordinary happened. And I would regard this as the most significant archaeological discovery of all time. In 1946, there was some Palestinian Bedouin down by the Dead Sea. Muhammad Ed Dib, he and his friend were looking for some lost goats and they saw some caves and they thought somehow had their lost goats got into the cave. And so Muhammad Ed Dib, 1946, picked up a rock and threw it into the cave, hoping to hear the sound of goats. But instead, he heard something sounding like when you drop a plate on the kitchen tiles, the crashing of pottery. And... Though they weren't looking for it, though they weren't expecting it, these Palestinian Bedouin boys discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found copies of the Bible, handwritten copies of the Bible that were led there, left there by a community that lived by the Dead Sea that date back to the 2nd century BC to the, and the 1st century AD. The documents span a 300-year period, but as early as the 2nd century BC. Extraordinary discovery. And you know, they've found every book of the Old Testament buried here amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, except the book of Esther. The most famous of all is the Isaiah Scroll. Now, not only did they have copies of the Bible... They also had copies of some other literature as well, how they lived their lives, what they did. This Dead Sea Scroll community, they were an amazing group of people. They basically existed to reproduce copies of the Old Testament. They wrote them out by hand, and they wrote them normally on pieces of finely crafted leather. And in their writings, we've been able to understand the degree that they went to to ensure that the, the copies were accurate. For example, in the book of Isaiah, it's a book with 66 chapters. They knew how many letters were in the entire book. And so when they'd completed one scroll of Isaiah, they went through and they counted every letter in the whole book. And if they arrived at the wrong number, what do you think they did? 
they didn't look for the mistake and try, try and correct it. They discarded and destroyed the whole scroll and started again. Now, that was no small thing. Like, it wasn't as though they went to Woolies and bought, you know, 500 pages for the photocopier. No, this was that carefully crafted piece of, of leather. Now, if it passed the number test, counting all the letters in the book, in the book of Isaiah, they knew what the middle letter of the book was. And so they would start with the first letter, the last letter, and they would sequentially move in. And if they arrived at the wrong letter, what do you think they did? Discarded, destroyed the whole scroll and started again. This was the degree, the level that they went to, to ensure that the text was copied accurately. They did their work well. So well, in fact, that we can compare our Bibles today with the Bibles that were copied from as early as 200 BC, the Old Testament. And again, we can see that this book has been amazingly well preserved, extraordinarily well preserved. So this is just some of the evidence that there is to to trust this book, the Bible. Just some of the evidence. Now, other sceptics have raised issues. People have said, well, 36 times the Bible refers to um, a group of people called the Hittites, but either in the plural or in the singular. Let's notice what Brian Wood had to say. He said there was a time when historians scoffed at the name Hittite or Hittites in the Old Testament since it was not known outside the Bible. So the Bible refers to these Hittites. And for a period, there was absolutely zero archaeological evidence of the Hittites. Nothing in literature had been discovered about them. And so people ridiculed the Bible as though when they referred to the Hittites, that the Hittites were just a myth. Well, that all changed with the discovery of a major site in Turkey today. In Turkey today, you can go to a place called Hattusis, and there you find the capital of this enormous Hittite nation. It's a large place. Perhaps some people have travelled to Turkey and seen this, um, it's, it really is a major tourist uh, site today. And there you can see where this enormous capital, the Hittites had an empire. And you can see the enormous area that they had, some of their old buildings here, their carvings in stone and so forth. The Hittites did exist and there's no doubt whatsoever of their historical existence. Now, sceptics have also raised the issue that the Bible refers to individuals, that there's no other outside history of. And one of these is a man called Belshazzar, king of Babylon. No outside evidence, nada, zilch, absolutely nothing. And so people were saying you can't trust the Bible. Well, guess what? Numerous archaeological finds did, in fact, find references to Belshazzar, king of Babylon. There you'll see uh, Nabonidus's chronicle, Nabonidus's cylinder, and um, yeah, even Rembrandt painted pictures of this, of this guy. And uh, there's others beside. There's, there's many more we could go into. But people ask this question, okay, if the Bible's accurate, what does that prove? It just proves that the Bible has some accurate details in it. But why is that significant? How is that important to me today? How does that even suggest that the Bible is divinely inspired? People will say none of this proves 
that it is God's instruction book for humanity. Is there any evidence of any supernatural insights that come from the Bible? Well, I think there is something very significant in the Bible that does confirm some supernatural sources. And it's this. It's prophecy. In the Bible, there are some amazing prophecies. Tonight, in just a few minutes, we're going to look at an amazing prophecy from the book of Daniel. And uh, if you have one of those Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. As we explore this prophecy, tomorrow night, we're going to look at a time prophecy, which is truly spectacular. But tonight, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2. Tomorrow night, we'll look at Daniel chapter 9. Don't miss tomorrow night's meeting as well. So, Daniel chapter 2. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, there's this king of Babylon... And his name is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, we've got a lot of information about this guy. A real figure of history. He conquered Jerusalem. He conquered Israel. And when he did so, he took some captives back to Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is still famous in the country of Iraq. That was, it was Nebuchadnezzar that you read about in your Bible, that Saddam Hussein wanted to base his leadership on. And so, in Daniel chapter 2, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And he knew that this dream was very significant. And Nebuchadnezzar employed a whole group of wise men. There was diviners, enchanters, all sorts of wise men. They were on the king's payroll. And on this payroll, there were these four Jewish men. The main one was Daniel, who Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem as captives, as prisoners. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he had this dream, knew it was significant, but he, and he believed that the gods were trying to communicate to him. But he didn't understand the dream. And so he called in his wise men and he wanted his wise men to tell him what his dream was and its interpretation. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he was no fool. He knew that these wise men, if he told them the dream, that they could invent some way of interpreting it. He was awake up to that. So what he asked them to do was to tell him what he had dreamt and then he knew that he could trust the interpretation. And he said, if you can do this, there'll be a good reward. But if you can't, it was the death penalty. Now, these were serious times. These were men who could do, at, the, at their whim, impose a death penalty. And so it was a high-stakes situation. And the first thing that Daniel knew was that he had a knock at the door saying, uh, by the way, Daniel, you're in for it. You're, you're going to die with this death penalty because you can't tell the king his dream or the interpretation. And this was the first that Daniel knew of it. And so Daniel was in a situation. Let's have a look at a, a text. Daniel and his friends... They pled for just a little time. All the other wise men had had an opportunity. But Daniel asked for a little time, and he was given a little time one night. And the prophecy explains how Daniel was given the same dream and the interpretation of that dream. And then, the next morning, he goes into this king, Nebuchadnezzar, and tells him, O oh, king... You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was made of fine gold, 
its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and clay. So Daniel begins to tell the king the dream. And the king knew that this was the dream. It all came back to the king. That's what I saw. Daniel described it exactly. A huge statue with a golden head, silver chest, silver chest and arms, bronze belly and thighs, and iron legs and feet made of iron and clay. And so he describes this vision to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar could see it, trust it, and then Daniel gave the explanation to him. He explained exactly what all the details were. He goes on and describes what happens to this statue. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You see, while this image, this image of a golden head, silver chest and arms, brass, bronze belly and thighs, feet of iron and clay, a rock comes not touched by human hands, and strikes the statue on its feet of iron and clay and destroys it all, and then a huge mountain emerges. And Daniel explains what this is all about. He explains, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Daniel explains the golden head was a symbol. The golden head was a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire. And if there was one empire on the planet that had an enormous amount of gold... It was Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. That was the currency of the era. What he built with gold was absolutely extraordinary. But the prophecy goes on. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, just like silver is inferior to gold. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. So each of these metals is a different kingdom. The golden head is Babylon. The next empire that came along after Babylon, of course, the Medes and the Persians. They conquered Babylon, the silver empire. And the Medes and the Persians were conquered by the Greeks. And the prophecy here, think with me, this prophecy was written at least 500 BC. The next empire that came along was the Greeks. And the prophecy said that the Greeks would rule the then known world. And we know the story of Alexander the Great. A young man in his 30s sat down and wept. Why did he weep? Because he'd conquered the then known world and his troops refused to go any further. Extraordinary. And then we know Greece was conquered by the iron monarchy of Rome. And Rome really did use iron and it made a difference. So we can see this lineup of world empires from Babylon, the golden head, the silver chest and arms of Medo-Persia, the bronze belly and thighs of Greece, then the iron legs of Rome. But the prophecy didn't finish there. It really homes in on these feet of iron and clay. Now the extraordinary thing is, is that Babylon was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians were conquered by the Greeks. The Greeks were conquered by Rome. But what became of the Roman Empire? There was no one empire that came and took over Rome. Rome broke into at least 10 different pieces. Some of the, what came from the Roman Empire was strong 
and some was brittle, just like the iron and the clay. And we've got these feet of iron and clay. And the prophecy actually explains it for us. Its legs were of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Let's see. The Bible explains it for us. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And you know, when you look at time, and particularly Europe, where the, the Roman Empire was, and you look at Europe today, you will see some strong countries there like iron, and you'll see more brittle countries like clay. And the prophecy talks about how they don't stick together. And the extraordinary thing is, is that since the fall of the Roman Empire, many people have come and tried to unite Europe. Many people. Charlemagne did, tried to, but he failed. Louis XIV of France, he tried to unite Europe and failed. Napoleon tried to unite Europe, he failed. Kaiser Wilhelm tried to unite Europe, he failed. Adolf Hitler tried to unite Europe, he failed. Communism tried to unite Europe and it failed. And even today, yeah, sure, there's a trading block and the euro is used by a lot of European countries, but it's not a united Europe. There are still individual nationalities and still major differences between the countries. And if you really want to see the differences, just put on a game of soccer, folks, between two European countries. They can't even let the two different countries, the crowds, sit together. No exaggeration. One country is at one end of the ground, and the other country is at the other end of the ground, and they've got security between them, keeping them safe. They travel on different roads, different trains, different buses to get to the game, and they leave on different roads, different trains, different buses to go home. You can't say Europe is a completely combined entity today. There's still a lot of differences today. And, yeah, even soccer proves that. And here's the extraordinary thing, folks. This prophecy was given 550 B.C. 550 B.C. This prophecy... It was found amongst the scrolls of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not something that's just been invented in the last 50 years. And it's well known. Extraordinary knowledge about this. There's some bonus material I want to share with you just towards the end, which is really quite amazing about the fulfillment of this prophecy and how well known it is. But the key point is, is that for two and a half thousand years, this prophecy has come true in every way. And it comes from your Bible, this old book. It is trustworthy. It is reliable. And the prophecies make that point very, very clear. But the prophecy doesn't end with just a divided Europe, the iron and the clay. There's this rock that comes and strikes. Let's follow through. It says, And as you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And you know, when you, when you look at the royal families of Europe, the way they've interbred with each other. It really hasn't produced a united Europe. At the start of World War I, they were pretty well all grandkids of Queen Victoria, 
And that didn't stop World War I. And even today, it's not the, the seeds of the monarchies that are mingling together. It's across all of those nations. There's the intermarriage that's taking place, but that still isn't producing a united Europe. But let's look at this rock, this rock that comes and strikes the statue on the feet. And it says, and in the days of these kings. It's talking about, in the whole statue, the time of the feet, the iron and clay. This is talking about our era. And it says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So this prophecy isn't finished yet. There's something that perhaps we might see in our lifetime. It promises the setting up of a kingdom, not led by man, but led by God. And so we are living in an extraordinary time in Earth's history where we are seeing prophecy fulfilled and we may even see in our own lifetimes more amazing aspects of this prophecy being fulfilled as well. Let me come back to the man that we started with this evening, Albert Camus. You see, there was an American pastor. He was serving in France, Paris. This American pastor was pastoring a major church in Paris. His name was Howard Muma. And Howard was preaching away in this church in Paris. And one day, a visitor came into the church. And this visitor came back week after week after week. And Howard, the pastor, struck up a conversation with his visitor. He began to have Bible studies with this visitor. And then some questions were asked. This visitor said, the reason I've been coming to church is because I'm seeking. I'm almost on a pilgrimage, seeking something to fill the void that I'm experiencing. And no one else knows. This visitor was coming very secretively. He wasn't telling anyone other than the pastor who he was and what this was all about. He asked him another question one day. He said, Howard, do you perform baptisms? And Howard says, yes, I do. And then the visitor asked, what's the significance of baptism? What does this rite mean? And Howard, the pastor, explained what baptism means. And then the visitor said, Howard, I think I'm ready. I'd like to be baptized. This is what I'd like to commit my life to. Who was this person? It was Albert Camus, that famous atheist. At the time, he was the most famous atheist on the planet, but no longer an atheist. But tragedy struck Albert Camus. Within days of his planned baptism, he was killed in a car accident. He was never actually baptized. But he had made a very significant decision in his life. And so tonight, I'd like to ask you, what about you? The evidence that we've seen for the Bible tonight, does it make sense to you? Has it been clear? There's some more evidence I'd love to share. That old prophecy from Daniel chapter 2. Let me share with you a brief story. This is bonus information. If you go to France, in France today, there's a city called Metz, M-E-T-Z. In the early 20th century, it was actually part of Germany. 
And around the start of World War I, this enormous cathedral, which dominates the whole city of Metz, it needed a new lead roof. Can you imagine how much the roof would cost to replace that, all lead? The people in the city didn't have enough money to pay for the new roof. But there was a man who had an enormous amount of resources and wealth that heard about this, that wanted to help. It was Kaiser Wilhelm, the monarch of Germany. And he said, I will fund the new roof for the Metz Cathedral on one condition. And his condition was this. He said, at the front of the cathedral, there are four life-size statues of Bible prophets. He said, there's a life-size statue of Daniel. And Kaiser Wilhelm said, if you take Daniel's face off the statue, and Kaiser Wilhelm said, if you put my face there in its place, I'll give you the money for the new lead roof. And he said, because I'm going to prove Daniel's prophecy wrong. I'm going to unite Europe. And so the parishioners, they took Daniel's face off. And you'll see the remarkable resemblance today of Kaiser Wilhelm's face there on the body of the statue of Daniel. But interestingly enough, Kaiser Wilhelm didn't unite Europe. That old prophecy of two and a half thousand years ago of iron and clay not binding together some countries being stronger, other countries being brittle like clay. It still stands the test of time. Adolf Hitler, he heard about this. And he wanted Daniel's face put back on because he said, I'm going to prove Daniel wrong. And Adolf Hitler, with an army of five million men, couldn't unite Europe either. Because this old prophecy has stood the test of time. And to me, a God that can accurately predict the future and record it so that we can read about it two and a half thousand years ago. He's sending us an important message about this book. He's giving us evidence today that we can trust. Now we've got a clip that I'd love to share with you. This is for those who would like more evidence. We've got these, we've got the meeting tomorrow night, the evidence for Jesus Christ, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, evidence for Christianity. Then we're going to have a lunch break and then straight on in the afternoon, evidence for faith. But next week, we're running follow on programs more evidence. Let's have a look at the clip and, uh, and we'll come back to you. Your entire life consists of weighing up choices, whether it's the career you pursue, where you choose to live, or the friendships you make. But then there's always a thought, do these things really make us happy? And I was working at Goldman Sachs at the time, living in New York City, perfect view and everywhere I went there was a driver waiting for me to everybody around me I was living a dream but I felt like something was missing a deep need for something more so I had many questions growing up I just really wanted to get to the bottom of the truth I knew that there was something looking after me in fact I called it the thing I'd say to people, the thing's happening.
by the time I got to university, I was sort of like the persecutor of Christians. I was pursuing questions of the universe. Where did the universe come from and why are we here? My head is like in turmoil. And after I prayed, it all ceased. There is a purpose for life. When Jesus found me, that's when my life began to change. I just felt this, just a heavy load was lifted up off of me. It's the most beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thought as a Christian and as a university graduate, I shouldn't believe in something that I couldn't back up. I've been a Christian for 25 years, and I've never really asked for the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, just like Peter, I wanted to start sharing about Jesus, what he'd done for me. I hear this voice. All I need is your time. I created time. I can get everything done that you need done if you give me your time first. The I Am series is a chance to uncover the true meaning and purpose for all of our lives. It's an opportunity to examine the evidence for who Jesus Christ really is and what his death and resurrection means for all of us. Join us as we explore the difference that Jesus can make in our lives. Register at iam.org.au How does that look, folks? Looks fantastic, doesn't it? So this is a series that will follow on more evidence, and that's going to be on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. Now, if you'd like to sign up for that, um, our greeters in the lobby and outside, they'll sign you up so that you can be prepared, book your spot. So Thursday nights for the, the follow-on program, More Evidence. So um, you've been a fantastic audience. It's been a wonderful night tonight. And I'd like to thank you. I really enjoyed the meal, and I really enjoyed the music. That was... Did you enjoy the music? Yeah. It was fantastic as well. And just as a, a little gift as you go tonight as well, this, this little book, it's called Your Bible and You. If you haven't read this book, do yourself a favour. This is a Christian classic. I read this book and I've got to tell you, it transformed my life. It's not printed with ink, it's printed with love. And so, um, yeah, we've got some free copies. If you'd like to pick one up as you go this evening, help yourself and, uh, yeah, yeah. Enjoy it and be blessed. And we'll see you tomorrow night. And uh, same place, all different material, more evidence for Jesus tomorrow night. And before we go, can I ask a, a prayer of blessing upon you, please? Let's bow our heads. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us evidence. You've given us reasons to trust you and to trust your word, the Bible. And tonight, I'd like to pray for each person here. Hear their prayers, Lord. Respond to their questions. Lord, and for those of us who are walking this journey, give us eyes to see and to help people and to answer their questions. Father, you are a good, loving God. And we thank you, Lord for your love, your beauty, and the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, folks, and may I say sweet dreams. <laughs>